Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, good to be with you this morning as we continue our study of the final days of Jesus' ministry on earth, the uh, days of his final visit to Jerusalem, his death, and today we're going to be taking a look at his resurrection and what an amazing and life-changing story it is. So if we could begin, I'd like to share a word of scripture with you before we take a moment to pray. These are words that were written by the prophet Zechariah. It's one of those books that is actually dated. Zechariah tells us precisely when God gave him these words. And it was in the year 520 BC. In other words, about 550 years before the events that we're going to be discussing this morning took place. Here is what God gave Zechariah. This is a word directly from the Lord. And this is what he says. Zechariah chapter 12, the middle of verse 10. The Lord says, they will look on me. Please note that. They will look on me. That's God speaking. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him, as one grieves for a firstborn son. By the way, we actually have copies of Zechariah's work that have been preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Nothing has changed. They will look on me, the Lord says, the one they have pierced. And that is exactly where we left off two weeks ago with people looking on the one they had pierced, a Roman centurion saying, surely this man was the son of God, and people wailing and moaning because of the things that were happening in their day. Now, let's take a look at what happened afterwards, shall we? But first, let's talk to our Creator. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to speak directly to you for the assurance of knowing that for Jesus' sake, you not only hear, but you listen. And you not only listen, but you respond to our prayers. And so we cry out to you this morning, Lord. We pray that as you have promised, you will speak directly into each one of our lives. May the testimony of the early eyewitnesses be so compelling for us that we simply cannot resist praising you for what you have done. And may we understand more and more the truth of the resurrection of Jesus, the power of his risen life, the assurance that comes from knowing him and knowing that we too will be raised, the assurance that comes from knowing he is the first fruits of those who will rise from the grave. And so we long for the day of your appearing, Lord Jesus. We simply say, come, Lord Jesus. We say this morning, come, Holy Spirit. Fill us anew with your presence and your power. Come, beloved Father, and show us your amazing love. Amen. Well, today we're going to pick up where we had left off a couple of weeks ago. It's so good to be back with you. Uh, Jan and I spent the last week with all of our grandchildren, and we've just had a wonderful time. But I will tell you this. There is a reason you have children when you're younger, because the two of us were worn out every day, <laughs> and, and it always felt so good to hit the sack at night. Anyway, today we're going to pick up where we had left off two weeks ago, and I'd ask you to open your Bibles now to the Gospel of John, chapter 19, beginning at verse 31. You will recall that uh, two weeks ago when we ended the class, we had ended with the death of Jesus, his giving up his spirit, crying out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The, the very words that were prayed by little Jews Jewish children from the time they were youngsters. And even now, as Jesus has suffered the agony of the damned for us on the cross, at the very end, he commits himself to the Father's will and the Father's love. And uh, he, he, he gives up his spirit. As he himself had predicted, no one can take his life from him. He has the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. <laughs> 
And we're going to see that second power today in amazing brilliance in some incredible ways. But first, let's take a look at the rest of the story that occurred on that day that is commonly referred to as Good Friday. So if you would open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Let's begin at uh, verse 31, where John, who was the only one of the 12 who was actually an eyewitness to the crucifixion, where John gives us these details. He says, verse 31, now it was the day of preparation. And, and by the way, the day of preparation is the way Jewish people refer to Friday. Preparation day, preparation for the Sabbath, which is Saturday. And so it was Friday, the day of preparation, John tells us. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Yes, it was, because it was the first Sabbath of Passover. And, and by the way, there was something very significant about the first Sabbath of Passover, because we are told in the scriptures that the day after the first Sabbath of Passover was a day of special offerings. It was known as the day of first fruits. And by the way, it is on that day that Jesus would rise from the grave, on the day of first fruits, because he is, as the Apostle Paul tells us, the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. But John tells us the next day was a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the others. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, if you're wondering what is that all about, the answer is by breaking the legs of a crucified victim, you hastened that individual's death. The Romans had learned that when you hung a person on a cross, you did not do it in the way that it is often depicted in Christian art. Usually in Christian art, Jesus is depicted just as he is here with his legs straight his arms outstretched, but the Romans learned that if you do that, a person would die very quickly. You see, the reason for that is because the nails driven through the wrist would create such incredible pain that a person could not breathe. We talked about that a few weeks ago, unable to breathe. And the only way you could uh, exhale and then get some more air would be to push up with your legs. And so the Romans learned to crucify individuals with their legs bent. Consequently, if your legs were broken, it would mean you could no longer push up and death by asphyxiation would follow in relatively short order. And so that's what is done. In fact, the Romans actually had a special tool to do that. It was called a crucifragium. Basically, the first century equivalent of a Louisville slugger, a baseball bat. And they would shatter the legs of the victim forcing that individual to, to basically die because of lack of air. When they came to Jesus, however, they found he was already dead. And John then gives us this important note. He says they did not break his legs. Verse 34, instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it, meaning the author of this gospel, John, the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And by the way, that was something that was demanded of the Passover lamb. In Exodus chapter 12, we are told that the Passover lamb was to be a year-old male specimen without fault or blemish. In other words, a mature animal with no blemishes. Not one bone was to be broken when that lamb was slaughtered. And now Jesus, the perfect Passover lamb, has his bones unbroken, just as the scriptures had declared. But then John goes on. He says, and... As another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. And by the way, he is referring to the very passage of scripture that we started with this morning from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Something that Jewish people knew that they had committed to memory in many cases, and now they see it happening before them. They will look on him whom they will have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns. Did you catch it? 
for an only son, the only son of the living God who gives his life for the world. And as Zechariah said, God told me this. God said, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. Powerful, powerful things. Well, John does not stop there. He goes on to say, actually, let me rewind that tape. Could I? Is that okay with you? I, I, I forgot to mention this. John talks about the fact that Jesus' side was pierced with a spear, bringing forth a sudden flow of blood and water. What, what doctors and medical researchers tell us today is that is a clear sign that the pericardial sac was penetrated by that Roman pylon, that Roman spear. It means that Jesus truly did have a broken heart. And uh, there is no way you can survive. That is a fatal wound. If he wasn't dead beforehand, which he was, he was dead at that point. And John wants to make it very clear. I saw this with my own eyes. He was dead. There is no doubt about it. It is sure. It is certain. He was dead. And so then John records the following, verse 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because this was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. John is very scrupulous in giving these details, and he makes it quite clear of the Jewish customs at that time. By the way, those customs have been verified by archaeological research. We know that during the Second Temple period, the, the time of our Lord Jesus and the earliest believers, there were very unique burial preparations that were carried out. An individual who died was immediately, if that person had enough money, was covered with spices and the body wrapped in a shroud. They were then laid in a tomb and left in that tomb for a period of about a year. At the end of a year, after the, the body had decayed and the, the flesh had, had, had uh, basically uh, departed, the bones were gathered and they were placed in an ossuary, a bone box. And uh, that ossuary would remain in the tomb with that individual's family and relatives from that time on. That is the procedure that was carried out here with Jesus. And it's interesting, the two men who bury him, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Nicodemus is mentioned only in the Gospel of John. John tells us about the encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And now we learn that Nicodemus, who had actually spoken up in the Sanhedrin in, in defense of Jesus when many were trying to speak against him, now Joseph of Arimathea, a very well-to-do individual, and Nicodemus take the body down. This was an incredibly brave act, by the way. Uh, it, it was an act of mercy and charity, that's for sure. But these were men who were going against the prevailing view of, of their contemporaries. Uh, they, they were part of the ruling establishment. They, they were very well-to-do, and they were members of the, the Jewish High Council. But they went against their, their fellow representatives and gave honor to the body of this rabbi, whom they believed to be uniquely anointed by God and a prophet. And now they lay him in the tomb. The other gospel authors tell us that when they did this, the women were also watching, a number of them. And they saw exactly where Jesus had been laid. And uh, that now is where the story continues. We're going to move to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27.
as Matthew gives us some additional detail that uh, is rather fascinating to behold. And, and uh, we don't know exactly when this took place. Matthew weaves it in with the account of Jesus' death. Did this take place while Jesus was being crucified? Did it take place while he was being tried before Pilate? Did it take place afterwards? We can't say for certain on the basis of what we have in Scripture. What we do know is this. Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 3, Matthew tells us the following. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I've sinned, he said, for I've betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day, or a keldama. Then what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Now Matthew gives us those details. And many individuals, particularly those who are looking to find holes in the biblical story, have pointed to this and have said, well, we seem to have a contradiction here in the Bible. While Matthew tells us that Judas went out and hanged himself, uh, we read in the book of Acts chapter 1, and I've got that right up here on the screen, Acts 1, verses 18 and 19, the following account. Acts 1, beginning at verse 18, we read this. Speaking of Judas, it says, With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Now some have looked at that and said, well, the book of Acts doesn't say that he hanged himself. And the Gospel of Matthew doesn't say that his inside spilled out. And, and Matthew tells us that the priests bought the field, whereas the book of Acts says Judas bought a field. Uh, how, do you, how do you explain those differences? And the answer is, it's really not all that difficult. In all likelihood, what it means is this. Just as Matthew tells us, Judas went to the high priest in the temple after Jesus had been condemned. And he told them, I betrayed innocent blood. And they said, well, what's that to us? We don't care. <laughs> We've gotten what we wanted. <laughs> and Judas throws the coins down, goes out, and hangs himself. And then the religious leaders, scrupulous to the last moment, say, you know, we really can't put this into the treasury. And so in Judas' name, they go out and they buy a field, a field known as a keldama, the field of blood. And they buy it in the name of of Judas. And while all that's going on, Judas, who has hanged himself, um, it may well be that he hanged himself in an area where people just didn't see him. And in the hot Palestinian Israel sun, in the, the early spring and in the heat of the day, it doesn't take long for a body to decay. Maybe the body was found a day or two later. We, don't, we just really don't know. We're not given those details. But you know what happens when a body is left out in the sun and it begins to bloat? And pretty soon you would have exactly what is described in the book of Acts. It, it, he burst open and his intestines came out. It's a brutal and gruesome thing, but it is not a contradiction. And only those who are looking to find contradictions would say, well, this is impossible to explain. Uh, far from it. I might add, many of those same individuals will also talk about the resurrection accounts and say it's impossible to explain the differences. I hope to demonstrate this morning that it's very, 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 very reasonable to take a look at divergent accounts and come up with very logical and uh, consistent explanations to understand what took place that day.
And that's one of the things that we're going to do in just a little while. But let's continue now with the rest of the story. Again, going back to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, picking up at verse 62 and following. This is what Matthew tells us about some of the events following Jesus' death. Matthew 27, verse 62. The next day, the one after preparation day, in other words, the Sabbath, the the day after the preparation day of Friday, The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Now people have uh, discussed and debated for centuries, what was this guard? Were were these Roman soldiers? Were they uh, uh, legionaries? Were they members of the temple establishment, part of the temple guard? Uh, the, The Greek is rather interesting because Pilate's words can be translated, you have a guard or take a guard. It it, it could mean either use your own guards or it could mean, okay, I'll give you what you want. In all likelihood, on the basis of the evidence that has survived, these were Roman guards. And, And the method that was used to seal the tomb is a very interesting one. This is not unusual or unprecedented in Roman history to uh, seal something and make sure that no one would break in. The Romans would place a wax seal on the tomb in this case and run a cord from one side to the other and then seal that cord on the opposite side with wax as well. A a marker would be placed in the the hot wax indicating this was a uh, this was basically a a government uh, government operation and anyone who breaks this seal is subject to prosecution. It would be the the modern day equivalent of someone putting up a yellow police tape over a a crime scene and, and saying you can't enter this house or this particular building or this part of the building. And then the guard is placed there. In all likelihood, a guard of 16 soldiers. That would have been typical Roman practice. Uh, Guards who were on duty for uh, four-hour shifts in teams of four. And uh, they would guard the tomb throughout the night. Keep in mind, Israel is very close to the equator. And so the uh, sunrise and sunset remains pretty consistent throughout the year. You have about 12 hours of uh, sunrise, sunshine rather, and 12 hours of darkness. And so a team of 16 soldiers broken up into teams of four, each serving a four-hour shift. Uh, or a three-hour shift, excuse me, would uh, be able to cover the 12 hours of darkness. And that's apparently what took place and what is described here. Well, we, uh, we go on, and uh, we're going to look now at the events of the next day. The priests went to Pilate on the Sabbath. They explained what Jesus had said. He's been saying that on the third day he will rise. We need to secure this tomb so that uh, the disciples don't come and uh, steal the body, which, by the way, was pretty unlikely. These disciples were were not exactly the the most courageous individuals. When Jesus was arrested, they ran. Uh, And yet, in the back of the minds of the religious authorities, they know this this particular case has never been traditional. (laughs) and uh, they want to cover all the bases. As a result, the tomb is sealed, guards are set, the Sabbath is celebrated, and now we come to the next day, the day known as Resurrection Day, the first day of the week, the first day of the week after the first Passover, of, or after the first Sabbath of Passover, the day of first fruits. And it's very fascinating to examine what the various gospel authors say about the individuals who went to the tomb on that morning that is frequently called Easter in the English-speaking world. Matthew tells us that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. Matthew 28, verse 1. Mark tells us that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went to the tomb. 
Luke tells us that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and others went to the tomb. And John tells us in John chapter 20, verse 1, that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now, when you look at this, the, the first reaction that many people have is, well, how do you put all these pieces together? And what I'd like to suggest to you is there are some very plausible explanations for why each of the gospel authors who is giving reports back from early eyewitnesses, why each of them would hone in on particular aspects of what went on that morning. We do not have in the gospels one account that tells us everything that we know. Instead, each of the gospel authors gives us a unique snapshot of what went on that morning. And it's perfectly understandable why those snapshots would look a little bit different. Because that morning was absolutely chaotic. And as I hope we will be able to see as we look at the scriptures this morning, people were scratching their heads saying, what in the world is going on here? On top of that, you have the obvious emotions and, and, and the incredible agony and grief experienced by these early followers of Jesus. To, to anoint a body, as we're going to see, was usually women's work. And so it was the women who were going to go back and make sure the anointing had been done properly and tidy things up, if you will. But those women were in all likelihood coming from a variety of locations. We are not told what are all the locations were, but we can speculate. And the speculation helps us to better understand what we have recorded in the four Gospels. I'm not going to suggest that what I'll share with you this morning is the be-all and end-all. I do want to suggest that there are very plausible explanations for what we have recorded in these eyewitness documents known as the Gospels, the story of the Lord Jesus. Uh, before I go any further, I would like to mention a book that's been around for quite a while. Um, I first came across this book in the mid 80s. And even though uh, the modern copy has a copyright date of 92, my earliest copy has a copyright of 84. I think I read it about 1985. And it's just a very, very powerful book written by a superb New Testament scholar by the name of John Wenham. John Wenham is now with the Lord, but his book, Easter Enigma, Are the Resurrection Accounts in Conflict, is a fascinating study of what what took place that morning. And uh, Wenham, with a great deal of scholarship, careful footnoting, in a, a very thin volume. In fact, I, I brought a recent copy of it. I, I did check yesterday, by the way. It is still available at Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. But uh, a fascinating little volume, Easter Enigma. It, it is also illustrated with diagrams. It, uh, it is well worth a read. It is far more detailed than we're going to be able to go into this morning. And, and quite honestly, John Wenham makes some speculation that we cannot prove. But what I would like to do is, is take a look at the gospel accounts and uh, at, at least examine uh, some very plausible explanations for what we read there and try to reconstruct the events of that wild and amazing morning, unlike any other in the history of the world. And it's no wonder that people were amazed, confused, fearful, gloriously joyful, skeptical, you name it. All of those emotions, all of those feelings, all of those sensations were present. And for obvious reasons, because this had never happened before. Jesus had raised dead people, but we've never seen a dead person raise himself. Just as Jesus predicted, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. And so on that note, let's examine what we have here in the scriptures. And let's begin with a map, okay? Just to lay things out once again, I, I'd like to point out several things. You will recall that the events of the week we call Holy Week all took place in a very, very small area from the uh, western side of the city of Jerusalem all the way over to Bethany was about two miles, two, two and a half miles. Uh, from north to south, uh, less than a mile. 
it, it is a very confined area. And in that area, at Passover time, you would have had hundreds of thousands of pilgrims crammed in. This place was jam-packed with people and people from all over the world. The events that took place before Jesus' crucifixion, as we describe them and as they're described in the scriptures, uh, they began, for example, in the upper room. And the traditional location of that upper room is in the uh, southwestern quadrant of the ancient city of Jerusalem. Whether that is the exact site, we don't know. But uh, in, in all likelihood, that view which has been perpetuated for many, many centuries, going back to the earliest believers, it's probably at least, to use a horseshoe analogy, if it wasn't a ringer, it's close. Anyway, Jesus celebrated the Passover with the disciples in the upper room. He then took them over to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was arrested. He was taken back to the, the home of Annas, the high priest, and to the home of Caiaphas, probably here on the western hill of Jerusalem. And after that, was taken to Pilate. We had noted the fact that uh, in traditional Christian understanding, Pilate was uh, seated here in what was known as the Roman Fortress Antonia, although the latest research would indicate in all likelihood he was over here on the western side at Herod's palace. Jesus would have been taken there, tried by Pilate, sent to Herod Antipas, who was in town, probably staying at the Hasmonean Palace, which was located in the center of the ancient city, and then brought back for final sentencing to Pilate. He was then taken out to be crucified at the crucifixion site known as Golgotha, uh, commonly referred to by its Latin term, Calvary, which means skull. And uh, after his death, the body, as John told us in John chapter 19, the body was placed in a tomb in a garden that was near the execution site. And uh, that then is where the events of this wild and amazing day take place, near Golgotha, uh, at the site of Jesus' tomb. By the way, the most likely site of Golgotha and the tomb of Jesus is a rather fascinating one and, and is the subject of considerable controversy. Today, when uh, many tourists go to Israel, they are often taken to a site known as the Garden Tomb. And, and I have to admit, it is a very beautiful and lovely, a very peaceful and quiet area that is right in the middle of all the bustle of the city. It's near one of the, the big bus stops, uh, actually bus terminals, and uh, it really looks the way you would think the tomb of Jesus would have looked. As best we can tell, however, this is not the actual site. The tomb itself dates from many centuries earlier, we believe, and uh, we're told that Jesus was buried in a new tomb, a tomb that had never been used before. This does not seem to match the, the New Testament account. The site that has been pointed to by believers going back to the earliest centuries is an unusual and an unexpected site. It is known today as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's one of the oldest churches in Christendom. The original church was built by Constantine in the, uh, the early 300s. He actually sent his mother to uh, check out the site. On the basis of what we know, it appears that this site was recognized by the Romans from their earliest days as the site of Jesus' death and resurrection. And consequently, they actually built a pagan temple over the site. Uh, today, many pilgrims go here, and particularly Western pilgrims, find themselves a, a little discombobulated when they go into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It is very much an Eastern uh, kind of uh, worship center. And many are struck by how, if I may use the term, how gaudy it appears to Westerners. But there is a good deal of evidence that suggests that this is the actual site. The building itself goes back to the time of the Crusaders. The original structure was destroyed around 1000 AD and uh, the tomb itself defaced. But recent research done below ground indicates that this particular site really does match much of what we read in the New Testament. It is based, or it is sited over a quarry area that would have been a natural place to uh, hang bodies out by a major intersection. And there are very ancient tombs that go back to the first century in this very area and uh, underneath this very site. On top of that, 
the, the church itself is built within the old walled city of Jerusalem. And many people have looked at that and said, well, that doesn't match what the Bible says because it says that Jesus was buried outside the city wall. What we now know is that although this is now within the walled city of Jerusalem that goes back to the 1500s, in Jesus' day, and up till about 43 AD or so, this area was outside the city wall. It would later be incorporated into the city, but at the time of Jesus, it was, as the New Testament says, outside the city. And uh, as a result of that, uh, there is a growing consensus among even non-Christian scholars that re this really does represent the site of Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. There's one very fascinating part of this building, by the way, that I'd like to zero in on for just a second. This is what is known as the Anastasis. It's Greek for resurrection. Uh, our youngest daughter, by the way, is, is named Anastasia, Anastasia, which means resurrection. And uh, the Anastasis is a huge dome that uh, is placed right over the site of an ancient tomb. And uh, again, some of the latest research indicates this is most likely the very site of the events that we're going to discuss right now. So with this in mind, let's continue and take a look at what may have happened that morning as individuals came from various locations to check out the tomb and to make sure that Jesus had been buried properly by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And you can understand Jesus' followers, especially the women, wanting to make sure that the guys had done this right. The Sabbath is over. The sun is beginning to come up. And early that morning, on the first day of the week, this is what we read in the scriptures. We're going to start with the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. And I'm going to use the writings of all four of the evangelists as we basically reconstruct this story. And uh, here is what we read. Mark 16, beginning at verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Now, a few comments about that. Mark mentions three women. Mary Magdalene, who is a, a real enigma, quite honestly. Mary Magdalene is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke as a woman from whom Jesus had cast out seven, seven demons. And then she disappears. And, and she appears like a, as some have said, like a, a flashing meteor on the scene at the time of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, by the way, John Wenham, the author of Easter Enigma, makes a very fascinating speculation and does it with a, a good deal of documentary evidence to support his view. It has been widely dismissed by many, but I believe there may well be something to it. He suggests that Mary Magdalene is none other than Mary of Bethany. What we know about the other women is fascinating. Mark tells us that Mary, the mother of James, was there. A very early Christian historian, one of the first Christian historians, a man by the name of Hegesippus, writing in the second century, tells us that this Mary was married to Clopas and uh, that Mary was married to Clopas, the brother of Joseph, Jesus', ha Jesus stepfather. What that would mean is that Mary, the mother of James, was none other than one of Jesus' relatives, the wife of his stepfather's brother. Salome, who is mentioned here by Mark, is an individual whom many believe to be none other than the sister of Jesus' mother, Mary. And what we have then is Mary Magdalene, someone who is incredibly close to Jesus, his stepfather's wife and his mother's, his, his stepfather's wife, Mary, the mother of James, the married to Joseph's brother. Um, anyway, she goes to the tomb along with Mary's sister, Salome. Salome. 
his aunt. These are relatives, these are family members, these are people really close to Jesus. Now, one of the questions we have to ask is, where did they come from? Uh, there are several possibilities that, that stand out. One is maybe they were staying in Bethany, or perhaps if Mary Magdalene is indeed Mary of Bethany, that's where she would have been. Uh, in all likelihood, the close relatives, Mary, the uh, wife of Clopas or Cleopas, as he's also known, and uh, then Salome, Jesus' aunt, they may well have been staying with Mary herself, Jesus' mother. And uh, what likely happened early that morning is they all gathered together with a plan, and the plan was they would go to the tomb to anoint the body. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, we are told about some other women. And uh, the women that are mentioned by Luke also have a very fascinating background, as we're going to see in just a second. But what I'd like to speculate is that on that first morning, individuals who had been staying with Mary or were close to her decided they would go to the tomb to make sure that the body of Jesus was properly cared for. Well, Mark goes on to tell us the following. Verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Have you ever been in a situation like that, where you have these great plans, and then suddenly you realize, you know, there was something we didn't think of. Oh, golly. And in this case, it's, how are we going to move that stone? Uh, by the way, the earliest accounts that we have of that stone indicate it was incredibly large. Uh, archaeologists today have discovered many similar tombs in Israel, tombs that use uh, often a round, large round stone to cover the entrance. Usually the entrances are very small. You have to get down on all fours to go through them. But the stones are incredibly heavy and incredibly large. And the women are thinking, how in the world are we going to be able to move the stone? And that's the way Mark describes things as he talks about what happened on that first morning. Now, Matthew gives us some additional details. And so that's where I'd like to go next. Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 2. Matthew tells us this. After having said something very similar to Mark, that after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. You will note he doesn't mention Salome, but the absence of evidence, or the absence of that mention is not the absence of the event actually taking place. Matthew just gives us a little bit of detail and uh, does not go into the full description of all the people who went along. He says, verse too, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Can you imagine what that's like in the early morning hours as darkness still is over the land and suddenly a lightning flash and this glorious angel appears. By the way, when the Bible describes angels, it does not describe them in the way they are often depicted in medieval art as little cherubs with tiny wings on their backs. They are depicted either as individuals in human form who glow, or incredibly powerful beings who just overwhelm. And the soldiers are scared to death. They become, as Matthew tells us, like dead men. They are petrified by what they have seen. And Matthew's description gives us an insight into what took place then. Now, many people have the false assumption that it is at that moment that Jesus rose from the dead and came out of the tomb. And that is not what the New Testament tells us. As best we can tell on the basis of the New Testament, the angel came simply to move the stone away so people could look inside and see he's risen. <laughs> Keep in mind, when Jesus rose from the grave, it was still him. It was a resurrected body. But he was no longer bound by space and time as we are in these bodies. He was resurrected and glorified. And as a result, he could appear and disappear at will. As we will see that morning, that afternoon, that evening, he showed up at a lot of places to a lot of people. And they were overwhelmed. Well, Matthew gives those details. And then 
we turn to Mark for additional insight. Mark writes just one verse in Mark chapter 16, this fascinating description. Mark says, verse 4, But when they looked up, meaning the women he had mentioned early, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Now, Mark goes on to say that they then entered the tomb. But John the evangelist gives us additional insight. John, who is the only one who mentions only one woman, and that's Mary Magdalene, tells us the following. And I believe this is very consistent with what we read in the rest of scriptures. Apparently, these three women, maybe more, came to the tomb at the same time. And when they got to the tomb, after an angel had already scared the living daylights out of the guards who then fled, the women get to the tomb and they see the stone has been rolled away. Mary, the mother of James, and Salome go into the tomb. But Mary Magdalene immediately realizes something terrible has happened, and she turns around and heads back to tell the apostles. She wants to let John, who has been taking care of Jesus' mom, and Peter know what she has just seen, that somebody has rolled the stone away. And so we are going to continue with this eyewitness account as it's recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. John tells us early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Note that. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Not I don't know, but we don't. John's account is consistent with what we read in the Gospel of Mark. There were other women there. Mary Magdalene apparently left them behind and ran back to the home where Peter and John were staying. Some have speculated that John may actually have had a home in Jerusalem, but we have no concrete evidence to, to indicate that. Whatever the case, Mary Magdalene goes back to where John and Peter are, and she says, somebody's taken his body, and we don't know where they've put it. Well, the account continues in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 2, where we read the following. And again, Luke throws additional insight as he writes this. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Now, think of this. Imagine yourself in a graveyard, perhaps inside a tomb, trying to figure out what has happened here. John will give us some additional details that greatly help us understand what all was going on that morning. But Luke here tells us these women, and uh, he will mention some additional names in just a moment. Luke tells us that these women are there and they're wondering what could have happened when suddenly two men in shining clothes appear. And then Luke says the following. Verse 5. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners and be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Then they remembered his words. Now, it's rather interesting to note that Luke then goes on to mention some of these women, and he describes them in the following way in verse 10. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Now, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, both of them have been mentioned by Mark, also by Matthew. 
But who's this Joanna? Well, Joanna is mentioned earlier in the Gospel of Luke. And she is described as the wife of Cusa, who was apparently one of the chief financial officers for Herod Antipas. In other words, she's from the upper crust of society. As we had speculated in all likelihood, this is the woman whose son was saved from near death by a spoken word from Jesus. <laughs> and uh, she followed him from that time on. But in all likelihood, she would not have been staying with Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's probably with her husband. And as part of the official retinue of uh, Herod Antipas, she was probably staying at the Hasmonean Palace. Maybe the women had agreed before the Sabbath they would meet on the first day of the week in the early morning at the tomb. But in all likelihood, these women were coming from different spots. And by the way, it's fascinating to note that uh, Luke tells us it was not just Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, but the others who were with them. Apparently, it was a fairly sizable number of, of women who went there, perhaps coming from different sites and all agreeing to meet at a similar time. And it helps explain some of the things then that we read, because on this morning, people are in different locations and going different directions and coming from different sites, and they're clustering at the tomb, but they're getting there at different times, and they're seeing different things, and they are seen in different ways. And so Luke gives us these details, that the women see two angels. By the way, if you compare that with other gospel accounts, you will note that often it is only one angel who is mentioned. Is that a contradiction? No, in all likelihood, it means one angel was the primary spokesman. And as a result, uh, Luke gives us an additional insight. He says, well, there were actually two of them, and here's what was said. Uh, whereas we read, for instance, elsewhere in the Gospels that an angel appeared to them and said, um, not a contradiction, just simply various eyewitnesses looking at a single event from different aspects at different times coming from different circumstances. Well, let's continue on. John chapter 20, verses 3 to 18. And this is where we're going to wrap up this morning. We'll continue then next week. But uh, here is the additional insight that John gives us. Now, John is the one who tells us that Mary Magdalene left the tomb and went back to tell Peter and John. And so we read in John chapter 20, starting at verse 3, so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So in a foot race, we have documentary evidence from the Bible that John was the faster of the two. And uh, you, you can chuckle about that, but put yourself in the situation. Here are these two individuals who witnessed the greatest tragedy they had ever seen in all of their lives, the arrest and crucifixion of the one they loved and followed. And now they are in deep grief, trying to sort things out, not understanding the things Jesus had told them earlier, but instead living in absolute fear of what would happen next. And now Mary Magdalene comes to them and says, they've taken his body and we don't know where they've placed him. And so immediately, Peter and John go running, quite possibly from the southern part of the city of Jerusalem, heading due north, running through the narrow winding streets, going through perhaps the Ganath Gate to the site where he had been buried. And John then tells us the following. After having said that John outran Peter and reached the tomb first. John goes on to record, he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Now think about that for a second. The body of Jesus had been buried with about 75 pounds of spices wrapped up in shroud. And now the strips of linen are lying there, undisturbed. And you gotta ask the question, this does not look like a grave robbery. 
You know, grave robbery, first of all, you're going to take valuables, not a body. <laughs> but in a grave robbery, if you want to take the body, you'd have to remove all the, the coverings and take the body out. But they're lying there and, and apparently undisturbed. And John is looking in at, at what he can see inside in the early morning dawn and wondering, what in the world does this mean? Well, Peter gets there a little later, and in answer to the obvious question, how much later was that? I don't know. Are we talking tenths of a second, seconds, half a minute, whatever the case? Peter gets there a little later, and uh, we read, Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. That's so typical of Peter, isn't it? Uh, Peter doesn't hesitate to go in. Now, keep in mind, he's a devout Jew, entering the tomb where a dead body is would render him unclean for days, but he goes in anyway. Uh, this is one of the reasons some have pointed to little bits and pieces of evidence to suggest that maybe John was a priest, and as a priest would have been more hesitant to enter a tomb where a dead body had been. Peter, on the other hand, as, a, uh, as the big fisherman, he goes right inside to take a look. And this then is what we read. He went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. The obvious implication, this has not been tampered with. What do we have here? Finally, we read, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Let me ask you a question. What did he believe? He goes on to say, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, verse 11, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Let me speculate what may have happened next. Mary had gone back to where the disciples were staying. Peter and John had ran to the tomb. Mary, as a self-respecting woman of the first century, would not have run. But in all likelihood, she headed to the tomb as well after they left. She would have gotten there after they had arrived. And by the time she got there, apparently, they had already left. Perhaps they didn't even pass one another, going by different routes. But now Mary is standing there outside the tomb, weeping. She is a broken woman. The one she had followed, the one who had delivered her from demonic possession, the one she knew to be God's chosen, had been killed, buried, and now the body's gone. And what may well have been going through her mind is, won't you at least leave him alone in death? You know, how much more indignity can you heap upon him? And so John says, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. I, I love that description because it brings to mind something from the Old Testament scriptures from the Hebrew Bible. What do you think of when you think of a place where sacrificial blood, a sacrifice has been offered, and two angels hover above it, one at the head and one at the foot? It brings to mind the Ark of the Covenant. It brings to mind the place where the high priest once a year would sprinkle the blood of the sacrificial goat on the, uh, the top of the Ark as a sign that the blood covers our sin. And flanking it and bending over it were two angelic beings. Now we see something in real life <laughs> duplicated here. As Mary looks in, two angels hovering over the place where Jesus had been laid, where the body of the real Passover lamb had been laid in death. They asked her, verse 13, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. 
You can imagine those words spoken in grief, spoken in, in absolute frustration and bitterness and, and just a person who is at her wit's end. You know, they've taken my Lord and I don't know. Please note, she doesn't say, oh, wait a minute, what are angels doing here? <laughs> Instead, she answers their question. They've taken my Lord and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Her eyes were full of tears. She was distraught. She was quite possibly winded from moving at a fairly rapid walking pace. He asked her, verse 15, woman, why are you crying? Do you notice that he asked the same question that the angels asked? Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And let me tell you this, dear friends. When he calls you by name, everything changes. When the living God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, that changes your life. When Jesus speaks her name, all of a sudden, she recognizes his voice. By the way, when Jesus speaks your name, dramatic things happen. Remember what happened outside another tomb, not too far away from here, over in Bethany, just weeks earlier, when Jesus called Lazarus by name. Lazarus, come forth, he said in a loud voice. And out came dead man walking. <laughs> and now, the man who was dead, but who is now alive, calls her by name. And Mary is absolutely overwhelmed. John tells us this. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic or Hebrew, Rabboni which means my teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me or literally translated, do not cling to me for I've not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Jesus speaks to her very compassionately. People have argued and debated over what those words mean. Uh, many have, have gotten into deep theological arguments as to why Jesus said, don't cling to me or don't touch me. I've not yet ascended. In all likelihood, I believe what he's saying is, Mary, you don't have to hang on to me. I'm going to be around for a little while, yet I haven't yet ascended to the Father. However, Jesus says, go and tell the others. Tell them what you have seen. Mary Magdalene, verse 18, went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Wow. <laughs> Imagine how they are reeling at this point. In all likelihood, Mary goes back to the place where Peter and John had been. And Peter and John, who had seen the empty tomb, seen the grave clothes lying there, had quote unquote believed but not understood that he had to rise from the grave. They go back to the house and they're trying to sort things out. What does this mean? What has happened? And suddenly Mary comes back and she says, hey, guess what, guys? I saw him. He's alive. He talked to me. Here's what he said. And as Luke tells us, and we'll see next week, when that report came in, and the report from some of the other women came in, as we'll examine next week. The disciples looked at them and thought they were speaking nonsense. But there was so much more to happen that day. And that's where we're going to pick up next week. Let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, it's the old, old story. But it is still awesome. And it is absolutely overwhelming. We thank you for the power of Jesus' resurrection. We thank you that he is alive. We thank you that he's coming back. And by faith, we resolve that we will declare your praises. We will speak his truth. We will follow as his disciples 
disciples of the one who is not only our Savior, but also our Lord and our returning King. We give you all honor, praise, and glory, and we thank you for what you have done. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you same time next week as we continue up to Jerusalem. God be with you.